think sometimes we forget how spoiled we are with Liz Ann's playing of the piano and just how great you are. Thank you so much. from Genesis in the 18th chapter. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forget it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will not forgive the whole place for their sake. I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it, destroy it if I find forty-five there. And he spoke to him, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Late, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry. I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you this day, for you are my rock and my redeemer. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, it's amazing how sometimes uh, just a couple of words, a single word or a phrase, particularly from scriptures, can, can bring about images, can bring out emotions that... that and we're maybe in shock that we can find so much inside of us that, that comes from just a single word or a phrase. We need only hear it or read it, and our minds can become flooded with complete stories. You know the entire story from just a word or two. Uh, we go into conversations that automatically make their way in our mind to, to, the, to the front car in our train of thought. All it takes is just a word or a phrase. Close your eyes, if you would, and imagine just for a minute as I say certain phrases. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, you, you see the garden in your mind. You see the tree. You see the serpent come to life. The fall from grace as Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of knowledge. Noah's Ark. You can feel the rain coming. As Noah built the ark, you wonder... Who was it there that decided to keep the mosquitoes on the boat as we could have all done without them? We see the dove finding the dry land, the rainbow, a reminder of the new promise from God. Moses, the baby in the reeds, the parting of the Red Sea, the exodus of God's chosen people from bondage in Egypt. Mary and Joseph, it's the nativity scene from Christmas in the middle of July. Today's passage, we may find images that will fill our heads when we hear the word of the Lord to the newly renamed Abraham about the troublesome town. When I say Sodom and Gomorrah, I won't ask you what images you have. I won't ask you what things come to mind as you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. But the 
fact is, when we think about this story, we all have to admit that we fear being judged. We have fear of standing before others and having our faults, our own shortcomings, our own errors exposed to the world. It's a terrifying thought of being judged in the workplace. It's a wonderful example. We, we, we often dread the annual evaluation in your work review with your supervisor. You imagine sitting with your boss or even worse, maybe a committee as each and every flaw of the past year is illustrated and illuminated, you sit helpless, guilty as charged, but in prayer for a sense of compassion and forgiveness, the list of transgressions that you have committed seem to blot out any good deeds that you have done, any accomplishments that you've had over the year. The student, any school, dreads the return of a test or a writing assignment, the the sight of the red ink bleeding off the page as every mistake is highlighted and responded to in writing, it leads to feelings of angst and despair and suffering. The very best efforts and preparations could have gone into taking the test or writing the paper, yet the fear is still not being addressed. It's so overwhelming. Anything that you might, you might have felt that you had accomplished, any accolades that you thought might be coming, the fear of failure and being judged for it, overwhelming us. And in the Hebrew Bible, we see cases of judgment time and time again. Sodom and Gomorrah do suffer from judgment. Lot's wife suffers because of her doubts. And the entire nation of Israel is told by the prophets time and time again that the exile from the promised land is a judgment from the Lord for turning away from God, the ultimate transgression against our Creator. Isaiah, in fact, talks about the exile, and he compares it to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Fear of the wrath of God, the long arm of the law, the reprimand or suspension or expulsion, the demotion, the termination, all forms of judgment that bring about great fear and every one of us. But on the other hand, we are so quick to sit in the judge's chair whenever we get that opportunity. We find it easy to point out the faults of others. We, we join in judgment, maybe just to take the spotlight off of our own shortcomings. Every time you hear of a crime being committed, we jump at the opportunity to, to judge what's taken place. We linger over any possible physical description of a suspect. We jump to the worst possible conclusions about anyone involved. We invent the conspiracies in such great numbers without any regard for justice, let alone any sense of truth. We speculate on the most outrageous and the most unbelievable. Sometimes we even seem to hope for the worst in others, particularly when we can keep our distance from whatever situation is at hand. We judge other people. We, we judge other religions. We judge other nations, other races, other genders, other orientations, other cities, other sports teams, other schools, and even other churches and other followers of of Christ, ignoring the command of Christ to first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly the speck in your neighbor's eye. And judging others, it, it becomes all too easy. We ignore the advice from the Apostle Paul in Romans. We only remember the laundry list of transgressions that's in Romans first chapter. It's long, and, and we, we may be able to name quite a few of them, things that people have done wrong, but we don't go on to read the second chapter where Paul tells us, therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. Somehow or another, our, our instinct to judge other people 
comes to us as easy as, as eating or sleeping. It just comes away from us. And all too often, and all too often, the innocent are punished as a result of broad judgment. Collateral damage in the form of broken lives is the result of the broad and swift call to judgment in our lives. Yeah, I'll give you one great example of how this really works when the innocent are punished. Boycotts. Boycotts of businesses. It's a great example of how we may pass judgment or hurt the innocent. Um, we hear a, a call to boycott a particular business. We hear a call to boycott a particular city. Years ago, there was a call and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ was involved to boycott Taco Bell restaurants across the country. There was a call to boycott Taco Bell restaurants across their country for their exploitation of the workers who picked the tomatoes for their restaurants. And that was a bad situation. There was much to be made of the low wages being paid to the migrant workers. Boycotts were called for, yet the only true victims the only people who may have suffered were not the ones who were making the decisions to purchase the tomato and how much to pay for them. The stockholders never suffered. The CEO and the board of directors never felt the impact. If there was any loss of revenue, if there was any impact of this boycott of Taco Bell, it was made up for in the loss to the hourly wage worker who was let go from their job or had their hours cut because of a loss of business. It was the innocents who suffered, not the people who were the focus of the judgment. You know, we, we pass laws that are, are meant to stop crime, but oftentimes only serve to handcuff the innocent people. We use weapons of war, we use drones or other forms of high-tech weaponry. Yet we aren't always able to strike so precisely only the guilty or only our enemies. Children are lost. Mothers are lost. All for the, for the sake of aggression and judgment towards a specific group of individuals. And in our scripture today, we see Abraham asking God just how much suffering of innocence, how much collateral damage is allowed. How much is okay? Now we would be sorely mistaken to use this passage as some means of, of justifying acceptable loss of life, but it's, it's kind of fascinating to see the humble and uh, for the psychology people out there, the rather passive aggressive way in which Abraham uses his audience with the Lord to seek God's mercy. If there were 50 innocent people, he says, would you still kill everyone? If there were 45 innocents, would you, would you still? How about 40? 30, 20, 10. What is the number of folks who could die innocently and still make it rain down vengeance on Sodom and Gomorrah or in Afghanistan or in Libya or in Kansas or in Africa or in Oklahoma? Is it nine? Is eight too many? Seven? Six? Five? Is it okay to take one innocent life? Is it okay to take one innocent life in the quest for righteous judgment? And if there is an acceptable number, a percentage, or, or some figure of collateral damage that you can tolerate a, a low enough figure to let you sleep at night, then we need to ask ourselves the question. If that's our message, where is the good news in that? How does the gospel message resonate with the family of an innocent victim of our need for justice? Where is the gospel there? You know, recently in our country, over the past few decades, I guess it's been, we, we've been treated to an extraordinarily uncharted view into the the, the justice system of various governments, federal government, state government, municipal governments, and oftentimes these individual cases become very famous, very high profile for whatever reason. Some of them have involved famous people or celebrities. Um, 
Some have had overwhelmingly sympathetic victims. Others simply involve people charged with a crime that fascinates us for whatever reason. But we'd be hard pressed to find any one individual who would agree that O.J. Simpson, Casey Anthony, and George Zimmerman were all three innocent in some way, shape, or form. You're not going to find a person that agrees that all three of those were innocent for the crimes of which they were charged. Now, each case has its own merit, and, and they've been divisive for so many different reasons, and this isn't the time or the place to discuss the issues that divide us. What we need to do in church, what we need to do as followers of Jesus, are find those things which bring us together, things that unite us. And we as people operate under a law that seems to be, well, it really seems to lean towards mercy as opposed to vengeance. William Blackstone wrote in his commentary on English law in the 18th century, a commentary that's been used as a since then, as a formulation for almost all written legal systems, he wrote the following. He said, it is better that ten guilty persons escape than that one innocent should suffer. It is better that ten guilty people should escape than one innocent should suffer. And what is his reason? It comes from this passage in the story of Abraham and God. Far be it from you, to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of the earth do what is just. The good news is this. Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure that you get. The good news is found in mercy. Mercy. 